Yeah, thanks for coming out. And we find ourselves once again in the uh, seventh chapter of John. <clears throat> We're looking at verse 14 through 24 this evening. Uh, we, I know you'll be praying for Phil that he'll get better so that you can have him singing again. And uh, believe me, he would much rather sing than hear me sing. He just can't, so uh, hopefully that will will happen and uh, look forward to next week as Pastor Ivan mentioned down in Big Lake um, if you forget commonslaves.com we actually have a little website and there's some details there if you want to look that up it's for our service next Sunday evening but uh, it'd be fun to hear Pastor Ken bring the word down there we've never been down there and uh, looking forward to it it'll be exciting <laughs> and uh, Eric Anderson from Crosby emailed the pastor down at Bethany and said, Joe is too scared to ever ask this, but uh, he'd really like to sing a solo. And so, <laughs> uh, and they said, oh, that would be great. Uh, so I haven't uh, straightened that out yet. And uh, so I don't even know what to do about that. <laughs> Saying, yeah, yeah, this is so, oh, you know better than that. John 7, verse 14. Let's read the text and pray and jump in. When it was now the midst of the feast, that's the Feast of Booths, and Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? And Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And now, Heavenly Father, help us this evening to see the glory of God through the glorious Son of God, through the pages of Scripture, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless us for the time that we spend focusing on the glorious Lord Jesus tonight. For we pray this in his name. Amen. In John chapter 19, Pilate will ask the famous question, what is truth? And 25, 30 years ago, people would laugh at Pilate, saying, what sort of a question is that? I, but it's a serious question in our day, not just what is truth, but is truth? Is there even such a thing as truth? Is there even such a thing as right or wrong? And we would say, of course there is, but as you know, we live in a world of confusion. We live in a world that doesn't uh, only, th this world is not only unable to discern truth, it's unable to even figure out if truth exists which is really a sad state of affairs. The text that we have before us uh, is helpful in, and what we're gonna use it for this evening is to help us understand how we can evaluate teaching. How can we know what is true? How can we evaluate a teacher? In verse 14, Jesus arrives at the uh, Feast of Booths, he doesn't go with his brothers. We covered that last week. He, he arrives sometime afterwards. And now here in the middle of the feast, Jesus stand, he, he, he begins to teach in the temple, which is 
common for rabbis to do. They would just teach there in the temple, find a spot in the temple grounds and begin to teach. John doesn't uh, tell us here exactly what Jesus was teaching. Later on, we'll see some of the other things that Jesus taught, but presumably Jesus is uh, teaching about the kingdom of God. That, that was his custom. And Jesus' teaching prompts this question in verse 15. How has this man become learned, having never been educated? These people hearing Jesus teach were astonished, they were amazed, and they were amazed because Jesus was teaching as though he were highly educated, but he was not. He was teaching as though he was learned. He was teaching as a learned man, but he'd never been formally formally educated. And the point seems to be that Jesus was teaching with depth, Jesus was teaching with uh, intelligence, and Jesus was teaching with Authority. So when they say in verse 15 that Jesus had never been educated, it doesn't mean that Jesus was teaching as though he were ignorant and stupid. It means that his teaching was not like the product of the rabbinical schools of the day. Uh, the, the educated elite of Jesus' day had a teaching style, and their teaching was basically to uh, pontificate on and regurgitate and debate the various opinions and interpretations of other rabbis rather than simply teaching with the authority of the Word of God. They would say, this is what the law says, and rabbi so-and-so says this, and rabbi so-and-so says that, and this other rabbi says this, and they would just sort of build on what these other rabbis had taught and just sort of debate and kick those ideas around. Jesus does not rely on the opinions of other people. Jesus is teaching dogmatically this is true. And he does so without, if you will, sourcing his teaching. He does so without hedging his authority. He teaches, we know from the other Gospels, as one having authority. And so we, sh we shouldn't walk away from verse 15 thinking that the best teachers are uneducated. We, in other words, we don't want to draw out from verse 15 that formal training is of no use and, and learning from other people is useless and it doesn't exalt ignorance, but it does mean that at the end of the day, the only teaching that really counts for anything is teaching that is consistent with the will of God and the word of God. Teaching that's consistent with some tradition at the end of the day counts for nothing if the tradition is faulty and flawed. Jesus responds in verse 16 by saying to those astonished at him, those who are asked, how, how did this man learn this? Where did his teaching come from? If he didn't gain his teaching from the rabbis, if he's not just parroting what other People have said, if he's not just bantying about others' opinions, where does this come from? Where does his learning come from? And Jesus answers in verse 16 and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. That is, Jesus isn't just making them up. Jesus is actually appealing to an authority. He is teaching someone else's teaching, namely the teaching, the truth of God the Father, God Himself. Why bother citing the opinions of various and sundry rabbis when you know what God Himself says on a subject? There's no sense wasting time covering other people's opinions if you know what is true, if you know what God Himself says. And I think the way that Jesus spoke no doubt betrayed his familiarity with God's opinion, God's truth, to such a degree that one would listen to Jesus and say, you know, he speaks as though he has lived in the presence of God, or he speaks with such a familiarity with the things of God that he teaches as though he were God himself, which indeed he was. But how do we know whether or not we can trust Jesus? And interestingly enough, Jesus actually takes the time to help us evaluate and validate his teaching. Jesus helps us know how we can trust his teaching, and, and so we can use these principles that he gives us not only to 
help us understand Jesus' teaching, but we can apply them to all teaching that we hear. And we live in a world that is saturated with teaching, with theology, with religion. It comes at us from all quarters, whether or not we go looking for it, but especially those of us who, who live within the church and, and are thirsty for some teaching to be taught. It's widely available. And so how can we evaluate and discern the profitability of teaching? Now, what I'm going to do is take you through three couplets of words that sort of build on each other. And, and, and so the first couplet of words is the two words, obedience and source. Obedience and source. As we evaluate teaching, the first couplet of words that help us evaluate whether or not Jesus is teaching the truth and help us evaluate whether anyone else is teaching the truth is obedience and source. And this comes from verse 17. Jesus says this, If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. If you want to know if this teaching is from God or if I'm just making this up, you must first be willing to be obedient. If anyone is willing to do his will, obedience, he will know the source of the teaching. Obedience and source. First then has to come obedience to what is the known will of God. That is, if we want to know the value of the teaching, we must first be willing to do the will of God. And then that God-given ability to discern the source of the teaching actually comes afterward. And that is to say, we cannot divorce obedience to the will of God with the ability to understand and discern the word of God. This means that we're not allowed to sit outside and judge as an outsider and say, well, if I get all my questions answered and I figure all of this out and I, and I am very confident in everything that I see here, then I will perhaps decide to become obedient to the will of God. No, there must first be a willingness to do God's will and then comes the discernment. Then that person will know of the teaching, whether it is of God. One of the things that I found fascinating is that God's grace is so powerful and the gospel is so incredibly powerful that people are genuinely converted in all sorts of amazing and unexpected places. People are genuinely converted by the grace of God in churches that I would never recommend you attend because the gospel there is so corrupted, it's so polluted, it's almost unidentifiable, and, and if they got the gospel that messed up, almost everything else is completely out of whack. But an amazing thing always happens when someone is genuinely converted, even in a situation like that, by the Spirit of God, they are willing and desirous to do the will of God, and they, baby Christians, poorly taught, begin to see false teaching for what it is, and they begin to make their way to the door and go seek out the Word of God. Those who will to do the will of God will know and have great discernment. If you had a chance to go down and see the Martin Luther exhibit, you were no doubt blessed by what God did through that man. And Martin Luther was not only converted within the walls of the Roman Catholic Church, but even by the, the Catholic Church's own admission, he was converted during the period of the greatest corruption within the church. The, the Roman Catholic Church was incredibly corrupt, especially in the uh, 16th century when Luther ministered. And, and though it was never Luther's original intention to, to have the sort of impact that he did, Luther's passion and desire to obey God as manifested in the first of the 95 Theses to live a life of repentance that passion led Martin Luther into a discernment into truth that enlightened the entire European world. 
the, the veil lie thick over Luther's eyes until he desired by the power of the Holy Spirit to do the will of God. And he began to see false teaching for what it was. And he began to recognize the true gospel. And he upended the Western world. On the one hand, I as a pastor, along with Ivan and Joel, uh, we grieve over the idiocy of so much that masquerades as Christianity. But I think all of us would rejoice that even in places that we would never want to find ourselves, there are those people who are becoming genuinely converted. And those who are genuinely converted by God's power seek to do God's will. And when they seek to do God's will, even though they know so little by, by the ministry of the Spirit through what Jesus is talking about here in verse 17, they develop keen discernment and an ear for truth. And, and they begin to seek it out. And they don't stop looking until they find it. And so we are thankful for that. And so Jesus says... There is obedience that helps us understand the source. There's obedience and source. Secondly, there's the two words source and motives. And this comes from verse 18. Source and motives. This is a truism that Jesus says. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. This is something that uh, would be good to memorize and just keep this in the back of your mind. If you want to know what the source of the teaching is, check the motives of the teacher. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. So we ask, Jesus, are you seeking your own glory or are you seeking the glory of the one who sent him? You. When Jesus says he who speaks from himself, that doesn't, he's not talking about a person who writes his own sermons or a person who has his own ideas. It doesn't refer to people who do something other than just read the Bible as they teach. But there is, there is a kind of person who formulates his own doctrine in order to garner his own following. That person, Jesus says, is seeking his own glory. And the one who seeks his own glory, chapter 5, verse 44, cannot believe. It is impossible for the one who seeks the glory that comes from men to believe. So, the person who speaks from himself, verse 18, seeks his own glory. It is impossible for that person to believe Therefore, that's the mark of a person damned to hell. Now, let me give you three things to be aware of as you consider those who speak from themselves. Who, who is this person who speaks from himself? What does this person look like who seeks his own glory? I'll just give you three little words to watch out for that will sort of tip you off to a person who speaks from himself. Those three words are new, novel, and secret. This is going to make me sound like a stodgy old curmudgeon. But beware of a teacher who claims to have anything new, novel, or secret. Beware of that which is new. Some people gather crowds by claiming to have something new. This is something you have never heard before. Only I have it. There is a religion founded in the 7th century by a so-called prophet who claimed to have something new from God. And the prophet's name was Muhammad. His religion is Islam, and it is dangerous, and it is leading people to hell. But he gathered crowds because he had something new. There was a man in the 19th century who claimed to have discovered golden plates and he had magic spectacles that helped him interpret the uh, unknown language on the golden plates and that's how Joseph Smith founded the Mormon religion. This is something new, something exciting. This is the latest and the greatest and the Mormon faith still exists and still sadly leads people into hell. We like new stuff. We like the idea that God might do 
something for us or give us information that he's never given to anyone else. It's, it's part of human nature to be attracted to new stuff. And, and I would have to say I'm deeply concerned by the plethora of new apostles and new prophets supposedly conveying new revelations and new prophecies all the time. New stuff is how we got Islam. New stuff is how we got Mormonism. It's how all sorts of egregious errors are introduced into the church. And, and men and women who have all this new stuff always seem to have a crowd around them begging to hear it. And I think Jesus would say they are seeking their glory and they have their reward. Beware of that which is new. Beware of a teacher with new stuff who speaks from himself. Beware of the novel. Beware of the novel. Beware of those who say everyone else has got it wrong, but we got it right. We understand that tradition is not necessarily authoritative, but there is, I think, safety in carefully vetted tradition. I think we do well to remember that God actually did love our great-grandparents as much as He loves us, and we ought to be hesitant to say that God gives us things that He, he didn't give to them, or that we figured out things that the Holy Spirit didn't help them to figure out. We ought to be hesitant to say that every generation until ours was ignorant of some nugget of truth until the Holy Spirit decided to fill us in. Perhaps you could think of the Seventh-day Adventists here, those who are obsessed with the Sabbath and end times. It's sort of their novelty. And they attract people who are obsessed with the same sort of novel attraction. Be wary of any who are obsessed with a particular novelty of doctrine. And so if a teaching comes along that is outside the mainstream of historic Christianity and tempts us with a new spin on things, a new way of looking at things, a new interpretation, be very careful. Pay close attention, especially to the leaders of such a movement, because often they are nothing but what I call glory mongers. Jesus said, those who speak from themselves seek their own glory. Don't you find it interesting that when Jesus spoke here, he didn't say, uh, sorry, when Jesus spoke, the people didn't say, what this man says is weird, what this man says is novel. They didn't even say, we've never heard this before. Instead, they recognized that what Jesus taught was rooted in the Bible. It was consistent with what they had been taught out of the law, but what made Jesus' teaching special was not that it was new, not that it was novel, but that it was authoritative. Jesus wasn't novel. He didn't have to be. And he didn't try to draw his audience through novelty. And lastly, secret. Beware of secret. The idea of secret knowledge is close to novel, but perhaps there's a little shade of difference. Everybody loves to be in on a secret. Nobody wants to be out. I think all of us think or feel maybe like we're missing just one little piece of the puzzle that was going to make everything in life go smoothly. If we could just figure out this one little thing. Uh, once in a while you'll see an article about somebody who lives to be 110, 115 years of age. And if they're still in their right mind, a reporter will come and see them on their 115th birthday. And they'll say, what's the secret to living so long? And I always laugh because the secret usually involves beer and cigarettes. And I think, I don't, I don't know how that works. You'd think it would be kale and uh, no gluten, gluten-free, but, but it's not. It's, it's always something else. But, but we like the idea that there's a secret out there, and if I just learn what that is, all the pieces are going to fall into place. And this was the danger of the Gnostics in just, or in the early decades of the church, that early sect that taught about hidden secret knowledge, and it sort of became a club. We have these secrets that nobody else has, and, and therefore we're better. Larry and I bemoan those who make much of the mystery, that use the sort of language of mystery to say that the church has misinterpreted the Bible for the past 1900 years, but these people have figured it out and they have the secret that unlocks the meaning of Scripture. These kinds of 
Secrets always lead to pride. Always lead to pride. We're better than you because we've got the secret. We've got what you don't. On the contrary, the man, in this case Jesus, whose teaching causes those who hear it to glorify God as someone you can trust. When Jesus taught, when Jesus acted, the reaction was not, this is someone special, it was, God is great. Even Jesus' miracles, this is fascinating. Listen to the reaction to Jesus' miracles from the book of Luke. Luke 5, 26. They were all struck with astonishment at Jesus' miracles and began glorifying God. Luke 7, 16, in response to Jesus' miracles, fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God. Luke 18, 43, Jesus heals a blind man and the blind man regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. When you evaluate teaching, you must ask, where is the glory going? Who is being glorified here? If it is God who is glorified, you may trust the teacher. If it is the teacher who is glorified, you've probably got a self-glorifying charlatan on your hands. I don't think it does, that it means we can't appreciate those who teach well, men like Spurgeon and Calvin and Edwards and Hodge, these men of God who have faithfully ministered to the church in powerful ways. They're, they're deserving of our thanks and even to some degree our esteem because, because God used them in wonderful ways to make himself great and we can appreciate them. But those who are seeking their own glory speak from themselves, verse 18. Jesus says in verse 19, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? This, by the way, is not in the book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Ask questions like this. Accuse everyone of not carrying out the law and asking why you want to, they want to kill you. Didn't Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? What do you mean, Jesus? Well, they're murderous. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd, who also had not read the book, How to Make Friends and Influence People, accused Jesus of being demon-possessed. You can see that things are not going well here. You have a demon who seeks to kill you. And Jesus answered them, I did one deed and you all marvel. Now, the one deed that's in mind here is the uh, healing of the lame man back in John chapter 5. Uh, the man lame for 38 years beside the pool of Bethesda. And Jesus healed him, and you remember there's a big brouhaha because Jesus healed him and said, pick up your bed and walk, and it happened to be on the Sabbath day, and the, uh, the Jews got all bent out of shape. And so Jesus is revisiting that. Um, and, and so he says, verse 22, For this reason Moses has given you circumcision, not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and on the Sabbath you circumcise a man, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We go from obedience and source to source and motives to finally motives and justice. Motives and justice. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Isn't it interesting that uh, Lady Justice is portrayed as having a blindfold on? Uh, as say, Justice is blind, but isn't it fascinating that blindness equals clarity, right? Uh, that is to say, being unable to see, Lady Justice sees all things as they are. But the idea is that Lady Justice is not influenced by personal feelings. These people have personal feelings toward Jesus that color their understanding of his teaching. And the feelings that they have are feelings of hostility. Look back at verse 7 of chapter 7. Jesus says to his brothers, the world cannot hate you, but 
it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. You think you'll get a fair trial from a jury who hates you? Likely not. So the hostility toward Jesus colors these people's interpretation of what Jesus does. It colors their ability to properly understand what Jesus says and evaluate who he is and make it impossible for them to see when Jesus keeps and breaks the law. Now there's two laws in play here. When Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, there's two laws at work. The first is the Sabbath law that says don't work. But the second is, and, and Jesus brings this law in, he talks about the law of circumcision. What on earth does he talk about the law of circumcision for? Well, circumcision, as you know, is a surgical procedure and by the law of God, it happens on the eighth day. Now, I'm not much of a statistician. I think we have one or two of our into stats here. But if there's seven days a week and uh, a boy could be born on any one of those seven days, I think one out of seven is born on the Sabbath, which the eighth day then is the Sabbath again. So one out of seven boys winds up needing to be circumcised on the Sabbath day. Circumcision is a surgical procedure and as such is work. So we have two laws in conflict. And Jesus says that one law supersedes the other, and that is the law of circumcision. You'll notice in verse 22 that the circumcision law is not from Moses, but it's from the fathers. It predates Moses and therefore supersedes it. Circumcision is taking a part of a little boy that is not how God wants it to be and making it how he wants it to be, if you will. <coughs> if we, sorry, if we can explain that delicately as we can. Jesus has taken in healing this man, uh, an entire man who is not well and made him well. So the connection between Jesus healing a man and circumcision is taking something that is out of order and putting it in order for the good of the person. Okay? So circumcision is performing a service for that little boy uh, in order that he might come under the Old Testament covenant and, and in that way uh, take the sign of the people of God. Jesus is healing an entire person. The question, though, that would be asked is, couldn't Jesus have healed the man on Monday? All the problems go away if Jesus heals the man on Monday. This was suggested to Jesus in Luke 13. There was a synagogue official, quote, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. He began saying to the crowd, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. You could have picked a better day, Jesus. Now they were thinking along the lines of acts of mercy. You were allowed to do acts of mercy on the Sabbath, but they had delineated between acts of mercy and necessary acts of mercy. Some were more urgent. An act of mercy is any sort of charity, but a necessary act of mercy is something that absolutely has to be done on that day, like circumcision. If you have a son, you want him to be circumcised on the eighth day. And so you suspend, if you will, the Sabbath law in order to keep the greater law. Or if your ox falls in the ditch, you need to get it out. You need to perform an act of mercy for your ox. And so you drag it out on the Sabbath, even though, as you know, pulling anything out of the ditch is a ton of work. Jesus expands the necessary acts of mercy beyond that of urgency. Uh, acts of mercy, like mercy to the baby being circumcised, were keeping the law, and not, not circumcising on the eighth day would be not keeping the law. 
So if Jesus does not perform this act of mercy, there's a sense in which he is not keeping the law. Jesus is, in fact, keeping the law fully by healing this entire man on the Sabbath. So, verse 23, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken. We don't want to break the law of Moses. That's the big thing. Jesus is being indicted. They want to kill him. And the grounds that they're using to kill him is they say he has broken the law. Jesus says if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that is, and one little part of him gets fixed up, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That is to say, think clearly, think rightly, think deeply. Don't judge according to appearance. Your motives, people, are, are affecting your justice. Your hostility to Jesus, back in verse 7, is clouding your ability to see that Jesus is not breaking the law. He is, in fact, keeping the law. That he is not evil. He is, he is performing an act of wonderful mercy. Any understanding of Jesus that is objective will yield the inescapable conclusion that this man is the Son of God. Everyone who looks at Jesus and says, this is not the Son of God, you know there's a problem, not with their justice, but with their motives. Their motives cloud their justice, cloud their judgment. So their hostility to Jesus, back in verse 7, because he testified of it that his deeds are evil, assured that they could not evaluate him rightly. When we evaluate teaching, we must understand our own motives and be able to judge properly. There's always been hostility to the teaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. There was hostility to Jesus. There's hostility to the prophets before him. And there's been hostility to the people of God after him. And in every case, it is cov colored by horrific injustice because people do judge according to appearance. They do not judge with righteous judgment. Their judgment is clouded and they are unable to see Jesus for who he is. So, those are the three. Obedience and source, the source and the motives, the motives and the justice. Let me give you three quick applications and we'll be done. Here they are. Number one, am I willing to obey God before I know everything in order to know more? This comes from obedience and motives. Am I willing to obey God before I know everything? Am I willing to obey God in order that I can know more? We're never going to know everything this side of heaven. But are we willing to obey God as far as we do know? God always it seems likes to leave some fog for us. To just to see if we'll keep marching forward, trusting him that he will lead us even in the fog. I think of Abraham, who God said, I want you to move out and I'll tell you where to go when you get there. Is our obedience to God primary? Are we willing to obey God before he answers all our questions? If you're a teacher, what drives you? What drives you? What is your motive? Is your motive to make yourself known or is it to make God known? This is something I have to ask myself, so I'm just talking to myself here, not perhaps to you so much. What drives us? What, what is the motivating factor behind our teaching? Is it to make God known or to make self known? Those who really attempt to expound the Bible for what it is, do so in order to make God known. Those who expound the Bible in order to be profound and be flashy and want to make self known are invariably going to be false teachers. 
Lastly, what clouds my judgment? What clouds my judgment? Genuine objectivity, righteous judgment, verse 24, is really a difficult thing to obtain. We can be clouded by hostility, as those were here in uh, John 7. We could be clouded by favoritism. Really, both ends of the spectrum cloud our vision. <clears throat> some of you perhaps have been little league coaches and, and, and had some parent come to you and say, my kid is the next Babe Ruth. And, and of course they think that. And, and you're like, are you kidding? They, they don't even know which end of the bat to hold. Because favoritism clouds our judgment of what is real. Don't judge according to appearance. Judge with righteous judgment. What clouds my, what, what clouds my judgment? Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to condemn a false teacher that we really like as it is to embrace the true Jesus when we harbor hostility toward him. And so we ask ourselves, what, what are the things that cloud our judgment? All right, in two weeks, we'll pick up from here in verse 25. And uh, so next week, Big Lake. All right, Father, thank you for uh, these few verses. Help us to be discerning people. Help us to help us to judge with righteous judgment, that we may uh, nourish our souls with the Word of God. And not that which is new, novel, or secret. Father, deliver us from the temptation to strive after the new and the novel and the secret. Forgive us for our uh, propensity to run after false teaching. And help us, dear Father, to desire to do your will. That we may know of the teaching where it comes from. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.